Chairman, Dr. Cass, and Professor Toynbee, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me clarify that I'm here in my personal and not in my official capacity. Indeed, over the past 48 hours since Professor Toynbee agreed to this debate, I have done very little in the nature of my official capacity and have been more or less traversing beyond space and time a few thousand years of history back and forth, trying to disentangle civilizations and fossils. Mr. Chairman, in this hall last week, an analogy was made, a comparison was drawn, and a word was involved, evoked, a word also enshrining a concept, the word of morality. Morality is a word of great significance, touching the destiny of individuals, of nations, of the international community. But it was invoked by Professor Tony B. in even a broader canvas, in the canvas of history, in terms of history, spiritual coherence and purpose. I agree fully with a remark made by Professor Tony B. and reported in the press as to the nature of the world crisis of the yeah. present time. All agree today that this crisis lacks adequate definition. The common man, like the statesman, realize that in mankind's hands is reposed the crucial alternative of self-destruction or of redemption, of a new insight into history's purpose or of oblivion. And all realize that only through a decisive leap forward in the spiritual consciousness of mankind can the answer be found to this human dilemma. In the attempt at civilization in our time, and I'm using yeah. a phrase of Professor Toynbee, yeah. this leap forward must come from a deeper sense of morality. Before this body last week, Professor Toynbee, according to the newspapers of Montreal, compared from a moral standpoint the attitude of Israel to the Arabs in 1947 and 48 yeah. with the Nazi slaughter yeah. of six million Jews. Yeah. Let me say a word on this comparison. I must first say that the professor clarified that he was not comparing the two events statistically, but he insisted, so the papers say, that the moral comparison yeah. is valid. Secondly, he is quoted as having said the Jews had no historical right to Israel. Now, as far as one aspect of this yeah. analogy, the Nuremberg International Court made a finding that in the summer of 1941, plans were made for the final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. This final solution, as we all know, embraced, in fact, the putting to death in circumstances of unprecedented cruelty of six million of our people, including over a million children. It is a crime which human imagination still finds difficulty in grasping. In the biblical phrase, the earth cannot cover the blood in which it is soaked. There was here cold-blooded planning. There was government responsibility. There was execution to the magnitude of six million. And there was the result that a third of the Jewish people was wiped out, the great centers of its religion, of its thought, its culture, its social national movement, were obliterated. Professor Tony B. himself has denounced this cry in incisive terms. Indeed, till the end of days, mankind will brood the significance of this specter, unprecedented, of man's inhumanity to man. And as for my people, our mourning is endless. It is a mourning to eternity. Let us take the other side of the analogy. In 1947, over two-thirds of the members of the United Nations took a decision on partition with separate Jewish and Arab states. The Arab representatives on the spot announced they would resist, and within days an armed attack began against the Jewish community in Palestine. Writing on that period, the then United Nations Secretary General, Mr. Trigby Lee, in his book in The Cause of Peace, page 163, says, from the first week of December 1947, disorder in Palestine had begun to mount. The Arabs repeatedly asserted they would resist partition by force. They seemed to be determined to drive that point home by assaults upon the Jewish community in Palestine. On January the 21st, 1948, the British representative of the United Nations, Sir Alexander Cadogan, told the Security Council that for the Arabs in Palestine, the killing now transcends all other considerations. On the 16th of February, 1948, the United Nations Palestine Commission reported to the Security Council that powerful Arab interests 
both inside and outside Palestine, are defying the resolution of the General Assembly and are engaged in a deliberate effort to alter by force the settlement and visage therein. And again in April 48, the Commission referred to continued threats and acts of violence. With the expiry of the British mandate on the 15th of May, the Arab armies invaded, informed the United Nations they were intervening in Palestine with the object of establishing right and order in place of chaos and disorder. The nature of this right and order was immediately defined by the Secretary General of the Arab League, Azam Pasha, speaking in Cairo. I'm quoting a BBC yes. broadcast, 15th of May, 48. He says, the world would now see a war of extermination and momentous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Mongolian massacres and crusades. It was a war. There was heavy suffering on both sides, casualties, military and civilian. Through this war, large numbers of Arabs in Palestine were uprooted. At the same time, through this war, large Jewish communities throughout the Middle East were uprooted. On both sides, there was heavy suffering. Large numbers of Arabs left the country in order to come back in the wake of the victorious forces. No international authority has defined responsibility for the Arab refugee problem. It is our contention, and we can sustain this contention through Arab and other, including British sources, the refugee problem was the result of the war proclaimed by the Arabs and the result of an appeal by the leaders to leave in order to return as an Arab newspaper in Jordan put it, they told us to get out so that we can get in. We got out, they did not get in. But let us look at the results. There's an analogy in terms of morality, Professor. Yes. Of the Arab population, there are now 200,000 in Israel enjoying equality and every right side by side with the Jewish fellow citizens. I represent these Arab citizens just as I represent Jewish citizens because they're all Israeli citizens. In the refugee camps, it is true, there are large numbers of Arab refugees. At the same time, quite considerable part of them have been absorbed in the economy of neighboring countries. But even those in the camps, despite their suffering, there are many of them working, and over the past 13 years, their number has increased. In any event, there's a difference even between a parasitic existence and between total extinction. They continue to suffer because the Arab governments who originated this suffering refuse to relieve it by cooperating in the settlement of the Arab refugee problem. It is the same line of suffering died right down since 47 with the same source. Professor, there is a relationship between the two events to which you referred. The relationship is that in both cases the Jewish people was assaulted. In one case, a third of our people were destroyed. And the other, we resisted to the self-defense, and under a merciful providence, we succeeded. The second point of relationship is that through the experience of this Holocaust in Europe, our will strengthened, which we would do everything in our capacity, but never again should such a tragedy befall our people. But how can the two events of the destruction of a third of our people and of the Arab refugee problem created through a war started by the Arabs themselves, how can the two be mentioned in the same breath? Should we pass an amendment to Article 51 of the Charter of the United Nations on the right of self-defense, an amendment which says if you are attacked, you may resist? But remember, no matter what you suffer in the process, if the man attacking you suffers, you will be condemned by history. You will be condemned as having been affected by Nazi influences, you speak, Professor, with respect of Gandhi, of his concepts. You link him across the span of history to Rabbi Johanan ben Zakkai, one of our great masters of the law at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple. But I would say this, that as far as I've read, Gandhi, while opposing activist self-defense, never denounced those who pursued it. What should we have done? Allowed the Nazi experience to be repeated? be butchered. Now the criterion of moral defensibility I submit in all respects, sir, in this case it is vague and indiscriminate. Morality, unless specified and clearly defined, does not strengthen morality, but weakens it. Indeed, one might say it is a case of neutral moralism. 
Ernst Renan has spoken of la vérité et dans les nuances. But here you don't even have the nuances. You have two entirely different contexts of right and wrong. Professor, I would appreciate if you could clarify for me and for those present yeah. what exactly you meant by this statement which was quoted in the Montreal Press. Yes. 